Hi, I'm Kelly, and this week at Chicago Movie Tours, we are celebrating Jewish pioneers in film, television, and Chicago. On Monday, we looked at Jewish immigrant Carl Limley and three of his contributions to cinema history, including co-founding Universal Pictures, a studio that brought us movies like Frankenstein, My Man Godfrey, All Quiet on the Western Front, and eventually Jaws, E.T., and Jurassic Park. Today we are in Waldheim Cemetery, or Waldheim for the German pronunciation. And on this walking tour, we will recognize seven more Jewish pioneers linked to Chicago and the big and small screens. Maury Cohen, Clara Peller, Mike Todd, A.J. Balaban and his brother-in-law, Sam Katz, and Cornelius Rapp and his brother, George Rapp. Let's start with a little background on this cemetery. Waldheim Cemetery is located in Forest Park, Illinois, about 10 miles west of downtown Chicago. It was founded in 1873 as a German non-denominational cemetery, the only one in the Chicago area. Waldheim did not discriminate based on race or political affiliation. In fact, Freemasons, Romani, and German-speaking immigrants to Chicago could all be buried here. In the late 1960s, Waldheim Cemetery merged with the adjacent Forest Home Cemetery, also founded in 1873. This combined cemetery now is generally called Forest Home. In German, Waldheim means Forest Home. Again, in this walking tour of Waldheim Cemetery, we will celebrate seven Jewish pioneers linked to Chicago and cinema. Let's begin with perhaps the least known member of this group. Maury Cohen was born in 1884 in Chicago and died in Chicago in 1923, only at the age of 38. The industry magazine Exhibitors Herald reported Maury Cohen's death in its September 1923 issue. Quote, the operators through the Chicago territory mourned his death. He held the position of examiner of motion picture operators and was well known in picture circles. He was a credit to his profession, end quote. As best as I can tell, Cohen's position as examiner of motion picture operators involved keeping a watchful eye over those who ran movie theaters and issuing exams and, and licenses to them. According to industry manuals, examiners like Cohen were supposed to be knowledgeable in matters related to electricity, fire, and the day-to-day -day operation of projecting movies and running movie houses. Being the examiner of motion picture operations in Chicago during cinema's earliest days was apparently an eventful job. In 1917, two carloads of vandals pulled up to the White Eagle Theater on West 18th Street in Chicago. They entered the building and threw stink bombs inside, driving out all of the patrons. The following night, Maury Cohen, along with a friend and fellow union member named Armstrong, went to the White Eagle Theater to check things out. The two arrived just as another group of vandals had shot up the place. In the chaos, Armstrong was shot and wounded, and police mistakenly arrested him and Cohen for the gunfire. After things settled down, the cops took into custody another man, leaving Armstrong and Cohen free to go. Who knew being a movie picture examiner could be such a dangerous job? Perhaps that's one reason Cohen didn't live to see the age of 40. But that's not the case for the second person we're recognizing today. She lived to the age of 85. So we are now at gate 60 with Maury Cohen's grave. So let's walk over to gate 54 where she is buried. was born in Chicago in 1902 and died in 1987. For most of her life, she worked as a manicurist, but you probably know her best from the 1984 Wendy's ad campaign, Where's the Beef? It certainly is a big bun. It's a very big bun. Big fluffy bun. It's a very big fluffy bun. Where's the beef? Some ham. At the age of 81, Peller was cast in this commercial, which was a pop culture sensation. 
it spawned Where's the Beef bumper stickers, Frisbees, and even a Milton Bradley game. In fact, while in high school, my husband called into his local radio station in Mississippi and won a Where's the Beef t-shirt. Wendy spent $11 million on the campaign alone, and it paid off. In an interview at the time, Wendy's spokesperson said, quote, Our business has increased dramatically as a direct result of these commercials, and there's no doubt that Clara is the big reason why. People just love her. We know because we see the fan mail. When shooting the commercial, Clara Peller was hard of hearing, but that did not stop her from doing her job on the small screen. A production assistant named Dwight sat on the floor behind her out of camera's view. Since it was sometimes hard for Peller to hear her cues, when it was time to speak, Dwight pulled on the hem of her dress and then Peller belted out, where's the beef? During Peller's newfound fame, media representatives always threw questions at her and she, standing tall at only four foot eleven, responded quickly, holding her own. Has she acquired any boyfriends since her fame? Peller responded, well, there was this man in Mexico, but I didn't want him. He looked like Johnny Carson. How old are you? The media would ask. 64, she said. She was actually in her 80s. Clara Peller's Wendy, Wendy's ad did not go without controversy. For example, a Michigan group felt the commercial was a discredit to seniors. Wendy's vice president, of course, disputed that and, Cl and Clara always agreed. We are now at gate 54, so let's walk over to gate 66 where our next Jewish pioneer in film in Chicago is buried. Michael, or Mike Todd, was born Avram Hirsch Goldbogen in 1909. He has several entertainment related credits to his name. Let's talk about four of those. Number one, Mike Todd was an American theater and film producer. He produced 17 Broadway shows, and the most famous film for which he's known is probably Around the World in 80 Days. In 1956, it won an Academy Award for Best Picture. Number two, Mike Todd helped develop a widescreen film format called Todd AO. This widescreen format is no longer used, but Todd AO is still a company that produces sound-related services for movies and TV. Number three, in the 1950s, Todd acquired the Harris and Selwyn Theaters in downtown Chicago and operated them as a showcase for his widescreen productions and as a conventional movie theater. And number four, Mike Todd is probably most well known as Elizabeth Taylor's third husband. She had seven, and he's the only one she did not divorce. In March of 1958, Mike Todd died in a private plane accident. According to his friend, Eddie Fisher, quote, the only items recovered from the wreckage were Mike's wedding ring and a pair of platinum cufflinks I had given him, end quote. Todd's body was formally identified through dental records. About 20 years after Mike Todd's death, a woman was visiting a grave nearby Todd's. She discovered his coffin was empty. The lid had been torn back and the bag containing Todd's body had been removed. She called the police immediately. In their investigation, police said the grave diggers must have spent about four hours on this project. No fingerprints were ever found on the shovel that they used. So what was the motive? Well, according to newspaper reports of the time, the grave robbers were either plotting to extort money from Elizabeth Taylor, or they were seeking a $100,000 diamond ring, which Elizabeth Taylor had allegedly buried, uh, had allegedly placed on Todd's finger before he was buried. Todd's son, Mike Jr., said there was never a ring placed in the casket. Todd's remains were once more identified through dental records and were reburied in a secret location. We are, at now, we are now at gate 66, and our final stop today on our virtual walking tour takes us to gate 25. So let's start heading that direction. takes us to the Balaban family mausoleum, designed by architects Cornelius Rapp and his brother George. It was first built for Ida Balaban Katz in 1922. Ida died of tuberculosis at the age of 31. 
You might be asking, who are the Balaban and Rapp families and what do they have to do with Chicago and film? Well, to answer these questions, I have enlisted a colleague, Layla Royale, a tour guide for the Chicago Theater who specializes in old Chicago movie houses. Take it away, Layla. Thanks, Kelly. So I'm going to talk to you guys about some of my uh, favorite topics in Chicago history, and that is movie palaces and the Balaban and Katz Company. So let's first talk about Balaban and Katz. The Balabans and the Katzes were two separate Chicago families who joined forces in 1916 to form the Balaban and Katz Company. Now, prior to that, the Balabans actually owned a grocery store over on Maxwell Street, and they never did very well with the grocery store. It was said that they extended uh, too many lines of credit, and then they couldn't pay their own bills a lot of times. So one day in the 19 aughts, Gussie Balaban, the matriarch, went with her eldest son, Barney Balaban, to go see her second eldest son, AJ Balaban, perform at a local theater. And she was really impressed by the fact that people couldn't get in unless they paid first. They had to put a nickel in a box in order to enter. And she said, hey, this is a great way to make money. As long as you're getting people in, you are always turning a profit. So the Balabans decided that they would try their hand at the theater business. They pooled together their savings of just under $400 and they rented a theater called the Kedzie for a few months. They were so successful with the Kedzie that they actually opened their own theater down the street from it called the Circle. Now, the Circle was just as successful, if not more so, and it was around 1916 that they decided to join up with their friends, the Katzes, to form Balaban and Katz. The Katzes did have a background in the entertainment business, so it made sense that they would join up together. And it was in 1917 that they opened what is arguably the first movie palace in the United States, and it was their first collaboration with the architectural firm of Rap and Rap, and that is the Central Park. Now, the Central Park was on the west side. It still exists exists today, though it is in need of some work, and it sat around 1,700-1,800 people. It had one main stage with two small stages that resembled gardens on the side, meaning that there was always something going on, continuous performance as they called it. Shows would be non-stop from 9.30 in the morning until about midnight every day of the year. Now this model was so successful that B&K decided they wanted to expand and they wanted to have a major movie theater and all the big neighborhoods in Chicago. So they had the Central Park on the west side, a few years later they opened the Tivoli on the south side, and then on the north side they started with the Riviera Theater in 1918. The Riviera, fun fact, was actually closed for a couple of weeks due to the flu pandemic of 1918. But only two weeks, not several months like we're in right now. So. With all of these theaters, they were able to build their first theater downtown, and this was the flagship for Balabin and Katz and Rap and Rap, and is probably the most well-known theater of theirs today, and that is the Chicago Theater, which was built in this French Baroque kind of a style. Uh, it's a beautiful building, and I am definitely biased when I say that it's my favorite building in the city. Now, Balabin and Katz continued this model, and even to the point where they were building multiple theaters in the same neighborhood. Just down the street from the Riv, they actually built the up Uptown Theater, which is what you see behind me. And the Uptown was massive. They said it was an acre of seats and a magic city. And you'll notice the front facade there and all back behind that building is also part of the Uptown. It was massive. Uh, the Uptown today, it still stands as you see, but it needs about 70 to $90 million in repairs before it can be open to the public. It's not in great shape on the inside. Yeah. Now let's talk about movie palaces. Um, the Balaban and Katz model, they had these over-the-top theaters, and the idea was that the building was just as much part of the show as what was actually on stage and the film you actually saw. You had movies, but you also had concerts on Wurlitzer pipe organs. You had 50-person in-house classical orchestras. You had vaudeville acts, jazz bands, anything and everything on stage. These places had air conditioning. You could sit anywhere you wanted. You were treated like a king or a queen with surroundings that were straight from Versailles in some cases. Um, you had the best furnishings from Marshall Fields, antiques imported over from Europe. Just the best of the best of the best. And one of my favorite fun facts is a lot of these movie theaters also had free daycare. So if you didn't want to take care of your kids, you could pay to come in and then drop them off in the nursery for the day while you just like sat and watched whatever movie of the week they had. That's awesome.
So the movie palace idea is really one that started here in Chicago with the Balabans and with the Katzes and with Rap and Rap as the architects. And it's something that spread all over the United States and really helped create the American architectural form of the movie palace and helped shape America's movie going experience in the 1920s. And if you go to a movie palace made by Balaban and Katz and Rap and Rap today, you'll find yourself in just as much awe as you would have if you attended in the 1920s. Thank you, Layla. As she pointed out, the Balaban and Katz families and Rap and Rap are major players in Chicago cinema history. And this mausoleum, one of the biggest in Waldheim Cemetery, is a testament to that. Mausoleums are freestanding structures that can hold remains of any kind within their burial chambers, including cremation urns and caskets. Some of them serve as standalone works of art and examples of very specific styles. So what about the Balaban mausoleum behind me? What architectural style does it remind you of? A flat roof, thick columns that resemble the legs of elephants, concave molding around the top, a tapered entry, symmetrical vessels on either side, and massive dimensions. Well, Rap and Rap designed the Balaban Mausoleum in the Egyptian Revival style. And based on my research, I'm not quite sure why they chose this style, but we can make at least five guesses. Number one, Egyptian is the most funerary style of architecture. After all, almost all architecture in ancient Egypt relates to death and the afterlife. Number two, those of the Jewish faith generally accept Egyptian architecture since much of their religion, religious history is rooted in that region. Number three, Egyptian mausoleums are visually pleasing and Rap and Rap knew a little something about pleasing the eye. Number four, their simplicity in design makes them relatively maintenance free. And finally, number five, while Egyptian revival became stylish in the 19th century, it was even more pronounced in 1922 when King Tut's tomb was discovered. And if you recall, this mausoleum was built in 1922 by two architects who would have been, would have been paying close attention to trends of the time. Well, thank you for joining us on our walking tour of Waldheim Cemetery. I hope you enjoyed learning about seven Jewish pioneers linked to Chicago film and television. I'm Kelly with Chicago Movie Tours, and as long as we're sheltering from home, I'll see you next time for another Walking Tour Wednesday.